that's a rule of thumb. You can either stick your neck out, or you can stick your hand out. In other words, when you're walking with God and you're doing the things that he's told you to do or he's reminded you you should do, you have a question that you should ask yourself are you sticking your neck out or are you sticking your hand out for him to help you? Because one of the things that I found is that more often than not, most Christians I know forget the first rule that Jesus said. Even before they got saved, the first thing that Jesus said, oh, you forgot? You don't you don't know what Jesus said? The first thing the first thing he said? Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a joke. But what he said was, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So people will take up their cross and they'll follow Jesus, but the deny yourself part is always forgotten. That's the first thing that Jesus said to do. Deny yourself. Because we live in a society that doesn't want to deny anything for self, much less deny yourself. We are all about self. What can I get? What's in it for me? How will God make me to be me? How can he make me the best me that I can be? In other words, there's never a denial of self there. It's always about me how much more I'm going to become, how much better God has a plan for me, how much he's going to bless me, how much he's going to make me into me. Deny yourself. You see, you can't ever carry a cross that's going to kill your flesh until you learn that you're going to have to deny yourself because you have to quit doing your will in order to do his will. And the best way to tell if you're doing his will is to ask the first question first. Are you denying yourself? It's that simple. But I don't like that part. So I cut it out. Okay. Let's see what happens when Jesus says, did you do the things I said? What did you say, Lord? Deny yourself. Take up your cross, follow me. So, the first thing first is always deny yourself. And I always see that that is where people will stick their neck out rather than stick their hand out to God. Because they'll stick their neck out and say, well, you know, I, I did that when I first got saved, I denied myself. And now I'm doing God's will, so I've got His Spirit, so now I'm doing what He wants me to do to make me a better me so that I can find my purpose in life, so that I can do my, or wait, my, what about him and his? Hmm, maybe, maybe himself is more important than myself. Maybe thyself is more important than myself. Maybe if I could put the word my, me, or mine on anything, it really isn't about his, thine, or God, but more about me, myself, and I. You see, there's an unholy trinity, but it isn't out there in the world, and it's not safe. It's in you. So where are you at today when you consider well your utmost to do your uttermost to find the almost all that you could be to be what God wants you to be with the utmost for his highest. Because that's what we're doing in utmost video. We're not asking you to be second best. We're not saying let's take a rest. We're not even saying let's sit back on our accomplishments and our good deeds and our right attitudes. We're saying let's get real. Let's deal with these issues, you and I. Do you deny yourself? I don't. I frankly don't. I mean, I can be straight with you. I am still working on it today to deny myself. I am going out of my way today sometime in this ministry part to stop what I'm doing, put it all aside, clean house. Because it needs to be done. There are some things that need to be done. I have prayed about it. I've talked about, about it. I am doing what I'm supposed to do. But I also need to deny myself 
certain things in order to get done what I want to do and what he's told me to do that I should have done. So I know in me, I've determined that I want to do his will. I want to today deny myself something which would be to do all the ministry work that I really love doing because it's so much fun, you know, but I sure don't want to do so many other things like clean the house or begin to pack so I can move. But rather, I would like to do ministry stuff. So you see, there's always a spiritual excuse for not denying yourself. But you know, and I know, whether you're denying yourself. Because that is the most forgotten, the number one thing Christians don't do when they set about doing everything else that they want to do. Unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. These words of our Lord refer to our initial conversion. But we should continue to turn to God as children, being continuously converted every day of our lives. Every day, we are told, seek the Lord while he may be found. Harden not your heart, as it says in the provocation. He isn't talking to those that are not converted only. He's talking to everyone always. Every day we need to be converted. Every day we need to seek the Lord. Every day we need to harden not our hearts. And every day we need to hear from God. So we do what God says. And we haven't gone out of our way to rush through the day doing our will for myself rather than himself. It's easy to do. I know how easy it is because I like to do it. I like to jump up and run, but unfortunately in the ministry I'm in, the first place I run to is devotionals and then I have to run back to God and say, okay, I can't share with the people out there because you've already spoken to me in here about what I need to hear so that I could be there with where you are so that I could take the time to be with you and to care about the people like you want to care for them as you care for me. You stop me from doing those things that I would have stepped out and done on my own. You prevent me from going in the direction where I should not turn to. You coordinate my life so that I'm focused in on the things you want said and done, as opposed to what I want to do. It's hard for me to run away from it, because I have one of these, and I read it. Just like you're supposed to be buying one of these or getting one, and spending that time to kind of, you know, read it yourself. You know, talk to God about it, you know, and then maybe watch a video that'll maybe help drive it home. That'll help attack the realities in your life you might not have thought of, but that given that I'm such a shyster and I'm such a con artist and I weave and dodge and bob and, you know, kind of like do this kind of thing, you know, and I kind of hide from God telling me directly, not your will, but my will be done. You might catch some of his spirit as he works with me on doing not what I want to do, but rather reaching my hand out and not my neck to God to help me. We must become like little children. We must be always dependent. We must be obsessed with this idea that in us we possess no good thing. We must be so adamant about not stepping forward unless God tells us to do that we become possessed with that very reality that we are not the ones who have the strength. We are not the ones who have the ability. God is. It is his work to do because he's working on us to accomplish in us what he wants, not so that we can go out and do our own thing. If we trust in our own abilities instead of God's, we produce consequences for which God will hold us responsible. Do you really want to stick your neck out? Do you really want to stick your neck out? Now, think about it. Do you really want to stick your neck out and risk 
doing not what God said, doing your purpose in his purpose? Really? Uh-oh. Can I stand back for a minute? I think God wants to talk to you. If you're about seeking him to do what he wants, then you want to please him. So it can't be for you that you trust in your own abilities. Because if you do, you're deceived. Instead of God's abilities, because in God we trust. We trust in the Lord with all our heart. We need not our own understanding. In all our ways we acknowledge him and he directs our path. Otherwise, we're just doing a game. We're pretending that we're following him. And if you are, go somewhere. Argue about it. Cry. Weep. Pant. Rant. Rave. Hit a wall. Do something. Beat yourself with the book. Doesn't matter. But get it right so you can get on with it. When God, through his sovereignty, brings us into new situations, we should immediately make sure that our natural life submits to the spiritual, obeying the orders of the Spirit of God. Any time, <coughs> any place, anywhere that God tells you to go, don't worry about the practical part, go do it. Whenever God says do, don't hinder the work of the Spirit, go as the wind blows. For it's such as you will follow, God will provide. If you don't, you'll miss out. You won't find that blessing. You'll find that you'll wind up wandering 40 years in the wilderness to get to the same destination. You should have went the shortcut. Instead, because of your unbelief, now you go back 40 more years to get ready. God don't mess around. He's not being childish here. He's telling you some very strong, mature words. A bluntness to the reality of your life. Do you really want to take the long way around? Do you really want to spend most of your life wasting time trying to learn one thing? One thing? 40 years to get back to the place where they should have been when they could have walked in less than six months because of unbelief? And most of them perished? When God, through his sovereignty, brings us into a new situation, we should immediately make sure that our natural life submits to the spiritual. Just do as God tells you to, whether you understand it or not. Just because we have responded properly in the past is no guarantee that we will do so again. You can't expect you to be right every time. You can't expect that you will automatically do the right thing. You have to work at it and mindful of yourself that you are the issue. You are the problem. You're the one you're fighting. This is the flesh you wrestle with. This is your battlefield. You, not me, not the other guy, not the pastor, not the elder, not the teacher, not the people in the world. You're your own battlefield. You are the one that's wrestling with this. The response of the natural to the spiritual should be continuous conversion, but this is where we so often refuse to be obedient. No matter what our situation is, the Spirit of God remains unchanged and His salvation unaltered. God doesn't change His mind when He tells you to do something. He doesn't go, well, okay, so you didn't like that, I'll try this. No, you'll go full circle to get right back to square one where you started all over again and where you begun, then you'll go forward. But He'll take you all the way around back to the same starting point. And then He'll say, do this and you'll say yes or no. And if you go no, it'll be harder to hear and less understandable. But if you do obey, it's easier to hear and more understandable. It's just called the hardening of heart and the hardening of hearing. It's pretty simple if you do it his way, or pretty long-winded and long-winding road if you do it your way. But we must put on the new man, Ephesians 4.24 says. God holds us accountable every time we refuse to convert ourselves, and he sees our refusal as willful disobedience. Our natural life must not rule. Think about that for a second. 
Think about everything he's talking about here. The natural life. Every single detail of your life is natural. You know that. You get up in the morning. That's natural. You go to work. That's natural. You plan out your day. That's natural. You pay your taxes. You do your job. You do the work. You do these things. You go to church. You do your Bible studies. You do all these things. Those are natural things. Our natural life must not rule us. God must rule in us. In other words, every little detail of your life, since he knows every hair on your head and he's counted them, must be brought back into subjection of Christ. It must be brought back to him daily and offered to him as a living sacrifice. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of our God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's just the bare minimum. Denial of self, take up your cross, follow him. Every day we present all of our day to him. It's not about living after the natural things or even arguing whether you should do this or do that. It's about living after the spirit, walking in the spirit and knowing God who is the spirit and talking to him in a personal, intimate way that he can lead you every day in everything that you do in your life. To refuse to be continuously converted puts a stumbling block in the growth of our spiritual life. There are areas of self-will in our lives where our pride pours contempt on the throne of God and says, I won't submit. What can't you submit to? Can you submit to your wife? Of course. Can you submit to your husband? Of course. Can you submit to your elders? Of course. Can you submit to President Obama? Of course. Can you submit to the government? Of course. Can you submit to all earthly authority? Of course. Why? Because God said so. Because anything less than submission to authority is rebellion against God because God put them there for your benefit to learn and teach you submission. Why do you think you go through so much frustration? Because you haven't learned submission. It is rebellion to God. And it is evil. For all rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. And it is evil in the sight of God. Self-will will always feed pride. And pride is something that God hates. And he wants you to humble yourself. And the way you humble yourself is submission. The way to demonstrate your Humility is to submit to the things that are wrong at times that God may make right. That as you do it, as the Lord leads you, then you submit to his authority. Even as Jesus submitted himself to Pontius Pilate and stood there and he said, are you a king? And he says, of course I'm a king. He says, if, I, if this kingdom were of my, of my, if this kingdom were of this world, then my father would send angels and he would wipe you out. But this isn't my kingdom. This isn't my world. This isn't my home. I come from another place and so do you. So you do submit unto God and let those submission questions not be a sign of your rebellion against authority, whether it be in the land or in the natural realm or in your intellect or in your self-will, but rather you turn them like children over to God and you say, God, I don't like this situation, but because I love you, I will submit to your will to be done. Do you want me to do this? And you submit, not to those authorities, but to God who put them there. We defy our independence and self-will and call them by the wrong name. Or we deify our independence and self-will and call them by the wrong names. Every single born-again Christian who calls upon the freedom that they say, I was born free, is a liar. Every single born-again Christian that tells me that they are independent and free and that they can make it and determine their own situation is a liar. Freedom is not something that's been purchased or bought. Freedom is a deception that puts you in place of yourself, thinking that you are self-determinant, that you get to make your own choices, and you never have and you never will. For God created you. God will save you or God will condemn you. You are not free. You have a choice to make which destination you'll arrive in. That's not freedom. That's determination. You determine your destiny. Freedom is a false idea and a concept that people seem to 
play with and have been lied to for so long that they think they're independent. There is no such a thing as freedom and independence. It's been a god of this world who has brought this whole idea, personified by humanism, lifted up by man's self-pride and ego that I am free. And God says, from what? You were born in sin. You were conceived in sin. You were a slave to sin. Your wages is sin. You were death personified. And you are not free. But whom the Son has set free, he is free indeed. Because you're free from the burden of sin. From the burden of guilt. From Satan himself. You have been free from the things of this world to lay down your life. To give what? your life to Jesus. So are you free? No. You were given the opportunity to make a decision of what you will do with your life. When the Son is set free, is free indeed, but not free to be his own self. Free to choose God over Satan. Free to be obedient than rebellious. For we find in that love that God has for us, he doesn't want us to die in our sins. He wants us to be free from sin. And that's where the freedom lies. To live eternally with God, who gives us love and joy and peace. But not to be disobedient, which independence and attitude of freedom is that idealism that causes us to be subject to pride and we fail in the freedom that comes from obedience. To obey is better than sacrifice. It's better than this idealism that we don't know what freedom is. And America is the one place where Christians don't get it because they are not free. They are not safe and secure. But they are deceived in the idea of what they think freedom is, when in reality God wants to bring freedom to them from the sin that they're in, from the rebellion of their ways, from the self-will that has manifested itself in this idea that we are a free society. And the reality is the moral bondages are all around us. There are whole areas of our lives that have not yet been brought into submission. And this can only be done by this continuous conversion. Slowly but surely we claim the whole territory for the Spirit of God. It must not be a patriotism of a nation, but it has to be a realization of the Spirit of God working in you, that God can do and accomplish anything He wants to, because you have given up all of your life to follow Jesus. You have laid down your life for your brethren and for Jesus. You have given over the reality of any freedoms you thought you had so that God could control your life, so that the Spirit of God would live in your life, so that you would be full of life and love and peace and joy. Would you reach out your hand to God? and do his will? Would you stick your neck out and do your will? Oh, we say we'll do your will. Lord, I'll do it. I don't know what it is, but I'll do it. And I still can't hear you. What that you say? No, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. No, I didn't hear that either. You can't play games with it. That's not what we're here for. This is the utmost. You should say that to yourself. What in my life is not the utmost for God. What in my life have I not given all that I am for God? Do I really want to be my utmost for his highest? Or am I just playing with a game that I'm really about myself and what I can become rather than what God can do in me through his glorious way of working through me to touch people's lives that they can become more than me as I submit to God to be a servant and a slave to my master who has laid down his life even if it meant to be a doormat that others may walk upon 
Yes, that's what it means. It means you will lay down all your rights and privileges so that God can be all that he is and be your utmost defense, your utmost provision, your utmost life, your utmost breath, your utmost being. In him we live and move and have our being. In him, not in us. In us there dwelleth no good thing. The reality is if it's not all him, it's not the utmost that you could do. We must become his little children and turn everything over to him with the utmost concern and care that we have daily, always turning to him and asking him for everything, what we should do and how we should act and how we should pray and how we should speak and how we should be the utmost for his highest.